Welcome to the April Fool's edition of the Clark Howard Show, where all our advice will be terrible. No. Just kidding. Just want to tell you, our mission is the same on April Fool's Day as any other day. It's to serve you with advice and information that empowers you to make better financial decisions in your life. And I want to remind you that our Team Clark Consumer Action Center is available all week long starting this April Fool's Day, Monday through Friday, here to answer your questions for free. And we do this as we've done since 1993 because I want to make sure that you have a trusted source you can turn to with specific questions, concerns, issues you're facing with your wallet. If you go to clark.com slash CAC, you'll see how to get those questions answered for nothing. Priceless advice for free. Could you ask for more? In today's episode, I want to talk about something that, um, that I've been getting a lot of interesting feedback about, about security cameras at your home. In fact, we had a Clark Stinks about what I said about security cameras recently. I've been a big fan about them for a long time, but there is something you need to know that is a downside. And something else that has an upside and a downside, becoming a financial advisor or hiring one, how do you do that the right way? And I want to tell you there's a need in the marketplace for you if you want to help people with financial advice. I want to, I want to do that angle later in this podcast. But right now, I want to tell you story after story, Consumer Reports did an investigation that found that uh, a lot of cameras you use, the doorbell kind of cameras, a lot of them have extreme security vulnerabilities. Consumer Reports found that the, a lot being sold by Amazon by Walmart, Timu naturally. And these are still being sold in the marketplace with significant security vulnerabilities. Uh, CNET now says that they no longer recommend WISE cameras. I've been talking about WISE, W-Y-Z-E cameras since they came out. And why are they not recommending them? Because of privacy issues. Wise, a lot of the wise cams are designed to be used inside a house. And so I have now disconnected the interior wise cams that we had, except for one that's in our living room to watch our two dogs when we're away. Because my wife's always worried what they're up to. And as I've told you in the past, my wife says, if there's an emergency that I can get out on my own. She's saving the dogs. <laughs> Wait, you nod your head yes, Krista? Is that the rule in your well, house? They're Is really little, so it would really be hard for them to get out of a condo building. Okay. But you have two dogs, two cats. I know. Two goats. No. Two cows. Two, what, what are all the animals? Two dogs, two cats. That's it these days? Mm -hmm. That's it. Okay. One teenager. At home. <laughs> teenagers, that's a lot. <laughs> One teenager's a lot. Ten other things, living yeah. things, right? Anyway, um, this is, this is I'm, I'm being silly here. I shouldn't be. This is a real thing. And so just know that how you place these cameras is really important because other prying eyes may see them. I mean, remember when there was a big deal about how the baby monitors, the people were hacking into those, yeah. and, uh, and how creeped out, obviously, parents of newborns were, that creepers were hacking into this, the baby monitors. So I think there's a real distinction with the difference with the security issues that exist. If you have a camera outside for security, versus inside in your dwelling. And I'm okay with the one being in our living room, even if it's hacked into. But just know 
that the security cameras are very, very, very low cost. I mean, like the wise ones start at like 20 bucks. Very cheap. But it's also an entree that you paid for that may give, because of the vulnerabilities that exist with the security, may give some prying eyes an opportunity to look see into your life. Uh, you know what we never mentioned? What? I don't think we ever mentioned the Airbnb. We talked about it briefly on the podcast, like out of something else about the cameras. Yeah, that yeah. Airbnb is, if you didn't see that podcast or hear it, Airbnb is banned interior cameras in any airbnb listing remember i told that there was one guy who got caught busted with somebody else and the owner of the house like, oh, yeah. emailed the footage to his wife okay uh we'll go to questions timothy in arizona says clark a friend from my old college fraternity days is now a quote-unquote broker he can get me 11 percent interest on promissory notes the investment seems safe because it's guaranteed in quotes and because i trust my old fraternity brother but he wants me to send cash via either a cashier's check or zelle should i be concerned timothy this isn't an april fool's joke is it actually it? is <laughs> i've been holding on to it he asked me to read it on april fools oh man timothy gotcha but did he get me that i said no this? you caught it you caught it yeah Good job. All right. <laughs> Moving on. Catherine. Timothy, you should take all your money and put it into the promissory notes. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy in Wisconsin says, we added our children as authorized users on our credit card when they re left for college. They are now grown with budding careers and established credit lines of their own. Will removing them from this account impact their credit score? And if so, how badly? Yeah, it will affect them, Kathy. I don't know how much credit your grown kids now have, but what they should do is they should do what I call the leapfrog. There are so many great credit cards out there, no annual fee, there are the 2% cash back cards, they're really good if they pay balances in full. So uh, your kids should apply for their own cards first, then you remove them as authorized users on the cards that you help them establish credit with, and the impact will be basically nothing as long as they add additional uh, credit availability headroom with the new credit application before you remove them as an authorized user. And, and it's a great idea once your kids have launched and the whole idea of the authorized user thing was to help them establish a credit identity. You've done that, so pull it back, pull it away. Lance and Mrs says i own a home near the ocean the home is raised on pilings about four feet above the ground as required by local building code in the area the home is about 16 years old my insurance company is now telling me that i must add a skirt around the open bottom of the home if i want to continue my insurance coverage the home has never had a skirt and the skirt is not required by lo local building code and a house skirt is only a cosmetic change it does not provide any functionality can the insurance company require me to make a change to my home that is not required by the local building code and does nothing to improve the structural integrity and or safety of the home? Lance, I can feel your frustration coming at me from these words. It is so frustrating. The insurers, particularly with any coastal dwelling, are either saying curtains to you, kicking you out, or creating conditions that make you want to go look for other insurance. And that's exactly the hint you should take from this. It's not much of a hint. They don't want you anymore. Or they want to put barriers up that make you say, well, I don't want them anymore. So take them at their word. They don't want you. Go shop for new homeowner's insurance. I, I know it's really difficult at the coast, but Mississippi has not been hit as hard with the insurance companies saying get lost as other coastal states have been so before you cancel what you've got go shop around and see if you can fi find replacement homeowners insurance if you can find replacement insurance at a reasonable price that you're happy with then you've dodged this requirement for now but don't be surprised with the uh, tighter underwriting that's going on by insurers for homeowners in uh, areas that are subject to wildfire, areas that are subject to flooding, to 
hurricanes, the whole thing, that the requirements are going to get tougher and tougher and tougher and harder to maintain that coverage. So go shop. If you do okay finding somebody else, you tell them you're done with them and you don't have to put on the skirt. If nobody else wants you, see if you can negotiate on the skirt. If they won't, in order to maintain homeowner's insurance as a last resort, you'd have to add it, even though as best you can tell, it has no value for protecting the structure. In fact, they can, homeowner's insurance, like in terms of like what's legal, the building code doesn't really has matter. No like they relevance. can fire you for having the wrong kind of dog, um, right? There's the homeowner's of- insurance market is so dicey right now, you could have just received a notice saying they're not renewing you. Even though you may not have ever had a claim ever, it is a rough and tumble market now, and it has nothing to do with what building codes are or anything along those lines. They make the rules right now at the homeowner's insurers. Coming right ahead, I want to talk about how if you're looking for a new career, there are several right now that are begging for you. One of them is being a financial planner. I'm asked a lot by people, uh, particularly under 40, who feel burnout on whatever they're doing, where the opportunities are. And a lot of them are things that when I tell people, they kind of do an eye roll. They're like, I'm not interested in that. But hope springs eternal. And I want to tell you areas where there's just tremendous need. It was funny, I was on an airplane the other day and I was sitting next to two missionaries who were from a program. uh, We were in New York and it was a program they were doing with Mississippi State University where for the Baptist Student Union or Center or something like that, they go every year for spring break instead of going partying somewhere, they go and they do mission work and they were doing it in New York this year and I was talking to the two of them and and uh, the young lady I was talking to who's a junior in college, we were talking about what she's studying and what she's studying to be uh, an accountant. And I said, wow, you're brilliant. And her boyfriend next to me is like, why is she so brilliant? And I said, because of the fields that have an extreme shortage of workers, accounting is near the top of the list. And it's a field that, for whatever reason, nobody seems interested in going into it. And the average age of somebody in accounting is getting to be really, really, well, not young. Let's just leave it at that. And so there is long-term career opportunity in studying accounting, uh, becoming a CPA. This is a field that, that is begging for you. You have to like the work, but it's begging for you. Another, being a financial planner. Uh, Financial planning is a field that the workers have aged as well. Younger people have not been interested in becoming financial planners. According to Kiplinger, almost half of financial planners in the United States are retiring in the next 10 years. And The need for trusted financial guidance and advice is bigger than it's ever been because we're not people who are going to have pensions anymore. It's all on you and me. And so being there as a fiduciary, a fee-only financial planner, where you do only legally what's in the best interest of the client, is a field you can sleep well at night and make a good living helping people to financial security in their lives. And there are many, many fields like this that require education, training, particular degree, that the opportunity, the ramp of opportunity is great. And, you know, I talk about those lists of where the best opportunities are and a lot of times you'll hear something and be like, I don't care how much it pays. I don't want to do that. And that's fine. But if you hear something from me that sounds really interesting and it's got great 
long-term career potential, why not? Why not do something where you can earn a good living, you can help others, and you've got good stability in the job? And especially, you need to enjoy it. I know that I get a lot of feedback that I'm just off my rocker about this thing, that what really matters is whatever you do for a living, it's got to be something you enjoy. If you can do that game where you find something that you really enjoy and the career prospects are really great, grab it, run with it, and build quite a nice, secure life for yourself over time. Okay, we'll go to questions. Phil in Georgia says, I am 25 and have a 401k from my old job with about $8,000 in fidelity, but I'm now I'm a public school teacher with no future plans to contribute to any 401ks. Since I now contribute to a Roth IRA and a 403b, what is the best plan for the funds in the old 401k? P.S., as a fellow dirty bird, I am so excited for the Falcons next season now that we have Kirk Cousins under center. What are your thoughts on the 2024 season? You're the man. Hope springs eternal. <laughs> the Falcons, my beloved Atlanta Falcons, have had three consecutive seven win, 10 loss seasons. Long way from that Super Bowl I saw us lose seven years ago. And, uh, I'm hoping that Kirk Cousins is the magic pill because we got a lot of good players on the squad. We just haven't been able to put it all together. So, Kirk Cousins, I'm counting on you too. I completely forgot Back the, to question. the question. <laughs> no, I did not forget the question. <laughs> so, Phil, you have the eight grand in the 401k at Fidelity. Fidelity is a low cost provider, obviously. If you have your IRA, Roth IRA at Fidelity, you could move it gradually from there into the Roth, pay taxes on the conversion, and then you're in a situation teachers don't make a lot of money. You're not going to have a big tax burden moving the money from a traditional 401k that you had at your old job into Roth money, and then over the long haul, that will work really well for you. As for the Roth, contribute every dollar you can in it, in it first before you contribute to the 403B. Almost all 403B plans are junk. It's very rare for a 403B plan. And why we do this to teachers, I don't know. We give teachers a vastly inferior retirement plan than we give most anybody else. And these 403Bs are a crime against our teachers because they tend to have extremely high commissions, extremely high fees. And I hope you'll dig in and see what kind of fees you're paying in the 403B. If it's a typical 403B plan from a crummy, high-cost insurance company, they're going to make it tough for you to even figure out what the fees are. And if you determine that you are paying commissions and fees, unless there's any kind of match in that 403B, I'm going to go way out on a limb and tell you, in addition to fully funding the Roth IRA each year, any additional money you'd likely want to put in a straight old investment account with Fidelity or Vanguard or Schwab in low-cost index funds or ETFs, rather than pay the enormous fees involved in most 403b plans and it's a true example of where the congress of the united states is divorced from the needs of the american people that they have allowed this loophole where school teachers are ripped off to the end of earth and their retirement plans when other people are offered the option of the 401k which is overwhelmingly superior. Jordan in Oklahoma says, you mentioned that you were switching internet providers. I'm a person who plays video games. I hate the word gamer. And I am looking to rent a house. The major ISP in my area lists speed and price, but it doesn't list whether or not it's on a, it's on a fiber line. For online games, latency and consistency matters more than speed. 
What can I do to make sure the internet at a house will meet my needs before signing a lease? Am I just out of luck if I move and find out that the internet's no good? I love what you do and I'm thankful for all the advice. So Jordan, thank you for that. And if the internet is provided by a cable operator, it will normally not have a lot of latency because it comes through a coax. And so it will usually be okay. I assume you message with a uh, fellow uh, video People game play players. Video games. I did not say gamer. Mm -hmm. See, you video game enthusiasts. Video game enthusiasts who are in your area in Oklahoma. And you should be able to find out from them if there is a real latency problem. If it's from a phone company, if the only internet service provider is a phone company. Phone companies usually brag about their fiber if it is fiber. If they don't say fiber, assume it's not, and you will have a real problem with latency. Um, you can call the local phone company and find out if a particular address you're looking at is served by fiber or not. And that's not that hard a question for them to answer for you and hopefully they will get the right answer on it. Now, the only other answer I know for people who are gaming enthusiasts when they're looking for high-speed internet that allows them to be competitive with other people who are gaming at the same time is to look at Starlink. Starlink is where you buy a uh, micro satellite dish and it can move with you to wherever you go it's one of elon musk's companies and the starlink will likely be more expensive than what high-speed internet would be from a cable monster or a monopoly local phone company but it is very fast service if you pay for that level of bandwidth and you should be able to competitively game against others or with others Jim in North Carolina says, I am a boring DIY investor like yourself and have been dollar cost averaging in mutual funds since I was 22 through thick and thin. I'm a huge proponent of the fiduciary standard and I'm suspicious of financial advisor my best friend has signed up with. The term, you get the rise of the market without, without the downside risk, sounds immediately to me like a variable annuity. However, this advisor is making similar performance guarantees while selling my friend what he's calling buffered ETFs. I did research and they do not sound at all like ETFs, more like leveraged options. What is your opinion of these? So the purpose of buffered ETFs, which is a small segment of the investment market, referred to as buffer or buffered, these are exchange-traded funds that follow, they have a portfolio that they use derivatives to mimic the return you'd have up to a cap, much like you'd have with an uh, equity indexed annuity. That is the closest thing, not a variable annuity. An equity index annuity is the closest thing. And so what they do is they cap your gain and they cap your loss in one year increments is usually how they work. So every year there's a reset. You have to own them for the year in order for that to stay in play. Uh, you pay a meaningful cost in management fees, uh, meaningfully higher than you would with a plain vanilla index-based exchange-traded fund. This is really for someone who is at a stage of your life where you're uh, trying to have a portion of the gains of the market without suffering in a really bad year when your time horizon for needing the money is very short. If you were still in, in what's known as the accumulation phase of money, a product like this adds unnecessary expense and complexity, Jim, in your investing orbit. No need for it except in very rare circumstances where you're trying to gain some of the stock market gain, limit your loss, for the need of money in a short time horizon only is where it's most appropriate. So I hope that helps. If you want to know more about 
uh, buffer or buffered ETFs, whichever both terms are used, go to Investopedia or go to any of the uh, low-cost investment sites, and they will have a much more detailed explanation of how a buffer ETF or buffered ETF works. Again, very narrow market, not for most people. And I hope that you have an absolutely great rest of your April Fool's Day. Usually, I get my leg pulled pretty easily. Today, well, if you remember early in the podcast, Krista and Timothy's tag team you got to pull my leg. Because yep. at first, I was like, I thought it was the real thing. And then when it went to all the fraternity stuff and using yeah. Zell and all that, it's like, oh, I got it. Jump the shark. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> well, have a great rest of your day. Remember, we're here to serve you with advice that helps you save more, spend less, and avoid getting ripped off. See you tomorrow.